slide show. Yes. Got it. Slide show from current slide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you for. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, so our last talk of the morning session is given by Professor Andrew Bernewick. Is is there a laser pointer? Do you have a laser? Oh, no, no, no. You have to show on your screen. Oh wow! Okay. People will not see it. Oh God! Point. Use your pointer. I don't have a pointer. No, I just no. just my mouse. Yes. Oh, okay. This is truly dual uh, conference. Okay, well, thank you for coming back from the quick break um, and for um, to the organizers for the invitation to this uh, wonderful uh, um, center with such an amazing view. Um, I wanted to chat a little bit today about about flat bands and um, uh, to people that have heard this uh, my TBG talk it's not going to be the just the TBG talk. We're just going to try to obtain some solvable models of flat bands, even though they're a little bit um, um, artificial. But um, um, by the the, the function that they're artificial, you can get a lot of a lot of information. And then we're going to try to um, uh, go to uh, twisted bilayer graphing and see which ones of those um, um, points in these artificial models still apply. Uh, this was mostly work done by the people in the first uh, row, uh, Jonah, Dimitru, uh, Aaron, uh, Frank, and Fang. Um, let's see. Okay, this doesn't. Okay, so I'm going to skip this slide. We all know why flat bands are interesting, and um, this is part of the uh, many, many um, seminal contributions to uh, to the field early on. Now. The type of flat bands that we'll be looking at are going to be uh, not atomic bands. So we don't want to look at flat bands that are basically made out of uh, orbitals that are very localized, which have no um, uh, hopping matrix elements between them. We want to look at flat bands that have um, um, that come out of interference where uh, hoppings are very large in between the atoms. And this includes topological flat bands. And it turns out that there's a lot of them. There's a lot of these topological flat bands. And in fact, um, there, it's very natural for flat bands to be topological, as I'll show later. And it turns out these are not just um, um, thought um, um, experiments in stoichiometric systems. People can actually find flat bands at the Fermi level. This is a paper from Chelkelsky's group um, at MIT, where he analyzes some of the flat bands in this compound. Actually, this compound was in the same uh, appeared you know a week after this paper in our database but basically he uh, had already the experiment but you can also see that there's a lot of other bands around the fermi level so you don't can't really know what exactly is uh, due to the flat band or not so we're going to try to get a better separation of these flat bands from other bands okay so what's known in the literature about flat bands? Well, quite a lot of things are known in the literature about flat bands. It's known first that you cannot get exact churn bands with finite range hopping, okay? Or with finite number of bands. And by exact, I don't mean exponentially exact. I mean, really exact. Um, I um, conjecture that this is true for all the stable topological states, uh, um, but the, um, I have no proof of this. Then for other lattices, such as the Kagome lattice, which have flat bands connected to a quadratic touching. Um, there were extended states written down by uh, Bergman, Wu, and Balance um, back in 2008, which attributed to the degeneracy point. But in fact, they can be attributed either to the degeneracy point or to the flat band. Then the Haug group uh, has obtained models for many, many flat bands. You can see here a crazy model with many, many non-flat bands and a flat band sitting right at, for example, minus two. And this is how we got into this game by just trying to compute Wilson loops of these flat bands and finding that most of the time these Wilson loops wind, which means the very phase winds, which means you cannot localize the Vanya centers, which means these bands are topological. And then, you know, you can, for example, go into the Kagome lattice and ask what happens if I open that degeneracy point here by a gap, by a, a for example, spin over coupling. And you find 
that the only way you can open it is towards a topological band. The band will not become flat and it will not be flat anymore, but it'll be almost flat. And the only way you can open it is towards a topological band if you keep, for example, inversion symmetry. So there appears there's some connection between flat bands and topology. And um, this is not always true that obviously flat bands have to be topological, but um, I'll give you a reason why it's, um, it's natural. And for this reason, we have to get a a feel for how orbitals influence eigenvalues uh, of the bands in, in the Brian zone. And what I claim, and this is well known, uh, is that um, um, basically, if you start with orbitals on a lattice, and if you want to understand all the bands within the bandwidth of all those orbitals, then there's a very simple machinery that you can do that to get from the orbitals on lattice to the eigenvalues of the flat, of the, to the eigenvalues of the bands, um, um, in the Brian zone, and this is called uh, representation induction and subduction. You induce from the orbitals on the lattice on the on your high symmetry uh, or positions or non high symmetry positions, whatever weak positions you have. You induce into the space group, the Fourier transform. Then you subduce to the space group, and you get all the eigenvalues except for their order of the bands that stem from those orbitals. This was these are called the elementary band representations. They were done by Zach for two examples in 2001, um, but now they're tabulated. So let's see how this goes, because if we know this procedure, then we know which bands come from atomic orbitals, which bands um, 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 do not come from atomic orbitals, and hence are topological, and we know many other things. So for example, this is an example of this induction procedure. With inversion symmetry, Okay, I have on a square lattice or uh, um, a 2D lattice, um, rectangular lattice, I have four points in the unit cell that are inverse invariant. One point is the origin, the other point is the mid bond in the x direction, y direction, and mid cell. So I'm just going to give you this example for two points. The high symmetry points, the maximal weak oppositions, are these four, okay, because they're invariant under a higher group than just identity. And for example, the origin, the 1a position here, is invariant under um, inversion. And I can put two orbitals on it, S or P, just a representation of inversion. And then if I Fourier transform this, then since I don't have any translation, since my origin is there, then in momentum space, these S or P orbitals that I've put there are going to also have the same eigenvalues at all the um, uh, um, momentas that are invariant under inversion that the S or P had in real space because I have no phase factor. However, here, if I put an orbital, if I have a... a, a an atom or an orbital at the midbond, the midbond is invariant under not inversion, but inversion times a translation in the x direction. When you Fourier transform that, um, so you can again put S or P orbitals in real space, which have eigenvalue plus or minus one under this symmetry. But when you Fourier transform this, which is the you know induction real space and then um, um, uh, uh, Fourier transforming, you get the phase factor uh, e to the i k x which means that your, I, your inversion eigenvalues change between the kx equals zero and k equals the pi points. Same thing for all the other positions. And now you um, can immediately see that all the atomic bands by construction come from linear, can come from linear combination of only these eight solutions, eight uh, possible basis states, which are the SMP orbitals on these four sides, on these four maximum wave positions. And if I Fourier transform to momentum space, these are the atomic limits. So for example, S orbital at 1A in the center doesn't have a phase. So when you go to the momentum space, it takes eigenvalues one in the entire uh, four um, inverse symmetric momentas. The P orbital is the eigenvalue minus one. The S at mid bond in the X direction, remember it has a phase factor e to the IKX. So it's got eigenvalues one at X equals to zero, which was gamma, which are gamma and Y, but it flips the eigenvalues to minus one at X and M because the, the I pi is one. Same for all of the other ones. And what you see immediately is that the atomic limits, for example, have an even number of, neg of negative eigenvalues or an even number of positive eigenvalues, um, not an odd number. So you immediately see that, for example, also that there's a topological band here and the topological band is the band that has an odd number of inversion eigenvalues. And this is just half of the uh, uh, Foucault index, okay? And if I had a band that had an odd number of inversion eigenvalues, I would immediately know this topological, and that's the Z2 index. So this can be replicated for all this, 
all the all the groups and it's something that we'll use constantly during this talk so i thought i pointed out okay so now let's get back to flat bands and there's a way to generalize basically leaps method to build uh, flat bands in a way that basically shows you why it's natural that flat bands would be would would come out as topological so leaps method is the following you build a chiral lattice you take a lattice which has two sub lattices and an l tilde the l sub lattice has more sites per unit cell than the l tilde sub lattice and if i only have topics between the two of them then i'm going to get um, a number of zero most just because of s matrix is rank deficient okay so then leave leave hamiltonian obviously has chiral symmetry by for example the sigma z matrix and and then um, um um, it's got nl minus n till nl till the zero mode but it turns out that this is not necessary and you can actually add any hoppings between the smaller sub lattice this bk can be anything as long as ak this hoppings between the l sub lattice has for example a k independent value a with degeneracy na and na is larger than the number of sites in the l tilde lattice so for example for this this is the general uh, condition you'll still have flat bands without actually having chiral symmetry in the energy spectrum, um, uh, for example. So this is a generalized, uh, a, a simple, straightforward generalization of, of the Lieb lattice, but without chiral symmetry in the spectrum. And it's irrespective of the matrix BFK. Okay, so for example, this bipartite type lattices also uh, include all the line graph lattices, which you know, are not bipartite uh, uh, themselves, but and the split graph lattices, etc. So basically, they include, I claim, all the flat bands that we know without particle hole symmetry. Particle hole symmetry adds new things. But for example, if we take the Lieb lattice, which is bipartite, we get this flat band as zero. This is just exactly Lieb's um, um, lattice with chiral symmetry. We can break chiral symmetry and get it also. But for example, we can form the line graph lattice of the Lieb lattice, which is the checkerboard lattice of some special value of the of the hopping parameters, and we get this flat band. This can be understood as just taking the Lieb lattice and putting a huge potential on the blue sites, and basically integrating them out. Right. So all these methods uh, include not only bipartite lattices but also line graph lattices, etc. Okay. So now comes the punchline: Why are flat bands likely to be topological? You can prove the following theorem. So again. We said that if I know all the orbitals on all the in all the lattice, I know the eigenvalues of the bands at the high symmetry uh, points. So we know that in an L plus L tilde lattice, I have the orbitals on L plus L tilde. So I know that all these bands here, all the bands, the dispersed bands, including the flat bands, I know their eigenvalues. It's just the eigenvalues or the band representations, which we're going to call BR of the L lattice plus that of the L tilde lattice of the orbitals on those lattices. And we know that. But what you can prove, even though you don't have chiral symmetry, you can prove that the eigenvalues of the bands that are not flat come in pairs. Okay. For example, the eigenvalue here, you don't have chiral symmetry, but you can prove that the eigenvalue of this lower blue band at high symmetry points are the same as the eigenvalues of the higher one. And you can see them by labeling them in, in this um, in um, on, on the figure. And then you have and and they're the, they're the same as the as the eigenvalues of orbitals coming from the smaller from the L tilde sub lattice. So then you have this um, um, uh, identity that the band representations on L plus L tilde sub lattice is equal to the L tilde plus the flat band plus another L tilde. Okay, so that means that the flat band eigenvalues are the same as the difference between the eigenvalues of the L lattice minus the ones on the L tilde lattice, because I have two L tilde lattice. So it means that uh, the flat band cannot, can naturally be described as a difference of band representations, a difference of atomic limits, not as a sum of atomic limits. And hence, most likely is naturally, they will come out as topological. It doesn't always have to come out as topological. For example, the L, I can, I could have the L lattice contain the L tilde lattice um, by deformations, but that's doesn't, if that doesn't happen, then it will always be topological. So it's very natural that flat bands become topological because their eigenvalue data can be expressed as the difference of the eigenvalue data of two atomic limits rather than the sums. Okay, so for example, 
this is true in many cases you can build uh, um, you can build uh, um, lattices and check it and this theorem I don't have time to go into it can also tell you when I have when you have um, degeneracy points between the flat band and dispersive bands okay so I wanted to kind of do a, do a little uh, advertisement so you can take this you can take this this uh, geometric uh, um, point of view and implement it on a database and then you can out of those lattices, you can then brute force for the flat bands at the Fermi level. And what you find is, you know, and the flat bands that don't have many bands, unlike the, the, the initial compounds that I mentioned um, around uh, the Fermi level. And what you find is that out of the two, whatever, 100,000 materials stoichiometric that is in nature, about only 300 have flat bands at the Fermi level. So those are, um, you know, there's not an embarrassment of riches. There's only about 300 of them. And for example, there's some that have kind of neat flat bands like this one. Of course, uh, um, DFT needs to be rechecked. This was a high throughput calculation when you have complex materials. But um, these are the type of materials that are, for example, not known as to be magnetic. This is NM in the database, means non magnetic, that have flat bands that could potentially host more interesting states than just flat band ferromagnets. Okay. Yes. Can you give the exact definition of flat band? Oh, this is a very, very tough question. <laughs> so very, very tough question. So the um, um, the way the definition is given here is within 50 mil electron volt um, 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 uh, bandwidth, okay? But, and separation from, and within, you know, you can play with your you can play you can play with your toggles on the website, and you can check uh, you can check how how much um, how much uh, leeway you want to give yourself, and then if you get to zero compounds, then you're <laughs> then you should give yourself more leeway. But that's a very tough definition, right? Because if either it's exactly flat, and then we know what we mean, or it's not flat, and then we don't then then. But as in any experimental experimentally related uh, thing. Right. That's right. So realistically, here we don't want we want you know less than less than uh, ten bands around the around within one electron volt around the Fermi level, just not, not to um, um, you know fifty electron volts bandwidth um, uh, um, of the flat portion, and then you can say how many portions of the Brian zone are covered by the flat bands on the website. But yeah, that's that's very good question and very tough. Yes. There's some rule of thumb that can let me guess that it should be three hundred divided by twelve hundred thousand. No, no there's no rule of thumb. Yeah, I was very surprised. I was expecting. Uh, well, I actually, don't know what I was expecting, <laughs> but I was surprised. <laughs> yes. Wow, this is not the point I want to focus on. But yes. <laughs> In this construction, it's flat, flat. In the yes. Right. So uh, the high throughput is done by looking by checking for lattices that have we you know that have this lieb um form okay because you can check geometrically of course you can do the high throughput by just by brute force also and it turns out that 80 percent of them match but, but if it's no, there's all not always the no, 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 there's not always leap construction in chemistry, right? Leap construction really means really right. Leap construction is some very strong, okay. Even this leap generalized construction has very strong, right? You don't get that in chemistry, right? You're always going to get the approximate things, of course. So that's a very good point. Yes, yes. So when the number of sites is different from in each sub, in, could could I say why why when there's two sub lattices with different number of sites, why is there a flat band? So the flat band is the zero eigenvalue of the matrix that connects the two sub lattices. That matrix is not square; is rectangular, and a rectangular ma matrix imposes less constraints, right? It's got it's got it's rank deficient a rectangular matrix, so it has less um, um, rank than its highest um, dimension. And that, that gives you a zero mode, for example. 
And you know, I can add a constant to the zero mode and make it any, but that's is basically the fact that a non uh, a rectangular matrix, a non square matrix always has a zero mode. Thank you. Very good point. Okay, more questions. Okay, so now let's add interactions. Okay, so what we're going to study is a family of made up models. And these models are very artificial. They were first introduced, but very good. They were first introduced by Sebastian Niber, Pivy Torman, which actually possess analytically solvable BCS ground states with negative Hubbard U. But what we're going to try to study is the effect of topology on these models. So I've said that it's very likely that the bands are topological. We're going to study the effect of topology of this on this model. So, and then try to go to twisted uh, uh, bilayer. Okay, so basically this is the projector into the flat bands and it's our quantity of most interest. And the Hilbert space will be uh, spent by the projected operators into the flat band, which are overcomplete. And if I look at this, if I look, if I write them down in orbital space, I could just write them down as the projector operators in mental space would be complete. And they have the commutation relation um, this commutation relation up to the projection operator. So there's two the two ways of looking at it. I can look at it either in this orbital projected um, operators, which are over complete, or I can look at them into the band projected operators, which are complete. Both of them are good. Now, um, um, Pybe and Sebastian's paper, uh, um, um, Tom Science paper, basically proposed the po the uh, positive definite Hubbard Hamiltonian. And this is a Hamiltonian that's the SZ, projected SZ on each side, okay, into this into this band is a projected spin operator on each, each side. Now, if you expand this, what you're going to get is the square of these number operators, okay? And this square is proportional to the, to the diagonal part of the projection into the flat bands. And if you have this uniform pairing condition, which is, which says that, these projected operators, matrix diagonal part of the matrix element do not depend on the orbital index alpha, then you can basically obtain from this positive semi-definite Hubbard Hamiltonian, this attractive Hubbard model, okay? Because the off-diagonal term is the attractive Hubbard model and it's positive semi-definite Hubbard Hamiltonian which whose ground state you will know now becomes negative Hubbard model and you know the negative Hubbard model ground state. Now, how uh, weird is this uniform pairing condition? In fact, it's not weird at all. You can obtain it. Well, it is kind of weird. For example, in twisted bilayer, it doesn't work. And I'll show you what the what the what the things um, that what the results are. But in some models, such as the ones we've built, artificial, you can obtain it by symmetry. So, for example, if you have a rotation, okay, then the projected operator uh, diagonal matrix element will be for example, on these two orbitals, will be the same by symmetry. So you can impose this uniform pairing condition here by symmetry. So we consider this uniform pairing condition. And you, you consider no quadratic terms. Okay, So this is a very simple Hamiltonian, um, um, who also has an eta pairing symmetry. This is not exactly the eta pairing. Yes. I I start with a positive definite projected interactions. Pos well, this is positive semi-definite, yeah. You can get a two bound, yeah. Well, that's right. Okay. That's right. Because the ground the ground state overall is is um, so this is the mapping. So the mapping, it's an exactly, you see the, the minus just gives you the negative u Hubbard model. And now you've got pairing, okay? It's a weird, it's a weird, it's, of course, of course. Of, I'm not, I said, that, I said that these models are fine tuned, right? But, but there are some things, the effect of topology that I'm gonna show is not fine tuned. This is fine tuned, the interaction also, I said that. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's right. What was the motivation for that specific form? Was it the, the specific form of the original interaction is twofold. That it gives me the Hubbard model. 
Okay, so it has this SZ, so it says this minus sign, and there's positive semi definite, so I know it's a ground state. So if I find an operator who's killed, which is killed, if I find a wave function which is killed by the initial interaction, I know it's ground state. Very good. Okay, so it's got an eta symmetry, which is basically a derivative of the C and Young's eta. It's not a momentum pi, it's a momentum zero. And this is actually just the Cooper pair. And um, um, it commutes with a Hamiltonian. Okay. And it commutes with a projective spin, for example. It actually can be enlarged the symmetry u to u1. And then you can find, for example, these uh, uh, non uh, particle non conserving DCS states by just adding, by just doing a coherent superposition of eta as a two, two particle operator on, on, on the vacuum. And because this Hamiltonian commutes with eta, okay, the Hamiltonian commutes with eta. These are all ground states of this Hamiltonian. Okay, so basically you got an array of ground states of 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 uh, of, uh, of ground states that uh, are Bay by just taking this eta operator, which is just c dagger k c minus k, the projected ones, into the ground state. Now, for these states are very simple. You can compute ODLRO. This is the result. Mu is the filling. But fundamentally. What I'm more, more excited about because we want to go twisted by there is that you can compute the excitation spectrum exactly. Well, not exactly, but because they're not, well, the jury's still out if they're exactly solvable overall. But, but what you do is for the single particle excitation spectrum, you just take the ground state at some particle numbers. So now we work in particle number conserving sectors. You take the ground state at some particle number, which is just, you know, eta, this eta operator to the n where that's a 2n particle ground state time, uh, on the vacuum and you hit it with the band operator into the flat band or flat bands if you have more of them and what you find out is that the one body spectrum is exactly flat okay so you say oh and i'm getting something trivial exactly flat with a pairing gap that's proportional to the interaction okay so this is the one body spectrum it's exactly the pairing gap proportional to the interaction now, this is something that will change in twisted bilayer because the uniform pairing condition doesn't hold. So this, the fact that this spectrum is flat is a consequence of the uniform pairing condition. Okay, now you go to the two-body spectrum. And the two-body spectrum, you know it has to be interesting because the two-body state, okay, I have an eta operator again. So I know the two-body state is also eta to n plus one times the vacuum. So I know I must get a zero energy state here. But I know the two, I know the one particle continuum only has only has 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 a pairing gap, which is this. So I know the two body state has to have a zero energy state. So I know I have a Richardson uh, bound state. OK, so this is the two particle continuum. I have a scattering matrix, which we can write exactly. I'll, sh I'll show you what it is. OK, the triplet excitations are two decoupled electrons. No, no pairing turns out, but the singlet excitations turn out to uh, uh, be coupled and give you something interesting. So direct computation gives you that the scattering matrix is this with a negative sign where this math Cal U is basically these, these non-math Cal U's, okay? These, these U's are the project, the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, uh, uh, of the flat bands of the Hamiltonian. So they're just U, U dagger, okay? Now you see the semi, the scattering matrix is semi, it's a negative semi definite, so you can only have bound states. Okay. And it's got a huge null space because it's rectangular. Okay. Again, so this null space is actually just the particle particle continuum because I saw that the one particle excitation has a constant energy. The particle particle continuum must have, you know, a lot of these particles of, of two particles of this constant energy, not scattering. And the way you see it's got a huge null space is that the number of eigenvalues of u, u dagger is the same as number of eigenvalues of u dagger u. And that's a much smaller matri matrix. That's a number of orbitals by number of orbitals uh, uh, matrix. So that matrix has a huge number of, of zero eigenvalues because this number of non-zero eigenvalues is the same as that, of, as that of this matrix, which is much smaller. And this matrix is the effective Hamiltonian for the charge two non-zero eigenvalues of the scattering matrix. 
And it turns out it's just a product of the projection operators of in the in the band. So P is the projection operator into the flat band. Okay. So this is how the two-body spectrum looks. For example, you've got this large continuum of basically just two particle excitations, unpaired pairs. And then you got the Cooper band. And this is this is your this is the, of course your maximal bound state gap. This is this is this is the other the next ground state in n plus two particle sector. But what I wanted to focus here is the dispersion of the Cooper pair. Okay. The dispersion of the Cooper pair turns out to be important. And I'm just giving you the punchline here. This, this is the Hamiltonian that basically just characterizes the bound states. It's the product of the projectors in the in the flat band. And it turns out that the Cooper pair mass is actually the minimal quantum metric of the flat band. And um, this is an exact statement, okay? And the minimal quantum metric of the, of, the, of, the, of the flat bands basically gives you the Cooper pair mass. Now, it turns out that this model, as was pointed out actually uh, uh, by other people, uh, including uh, um, in Eris' paper, also has a symmetry that basically relates the charge two spectrum to the charge zero spectrum to the exciton spectrum, okay? And so they're actually the same. So it's a very, it's not a BCS model. It's a very artificial uh, model that, you know, by adding next nearest neighbor, um, for, for example, uh, interactions, you can get phase separation. So it's a very artificial model, but the, what's not artificial is that the Cooper pair mass is bounded or is related to the quantum geometry of the flat band. Okay. So this is what I want you to remember out of this, that the, 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 the stiffness of the collective mode has something to do with the quantum geometry. Now, how much time do I still have? I hope a lot. You write down the effective um, kind of magnet like Pinatonian for the uh, uh, you, you, you have s equals p. Yes. On, on, on each side, you put the 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 so this is this is not the effective. This is the this is the Hamiltonian. It's a it's it actually you know it breaks SE two, right? The SE two is is from the the eta pairing SE two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so um, could I write down an effective model for the bound states or what for the? Uh, yeah. The... I mean these models are close to being exactly solvable. Actually, if I we're trying to solve the four electron spectrum or two Cooper pair spectrum. And it's almost solvable too, which so so I'm not sure. Yeah, so I don't know if I can write down an effective model, for example, for two, two Cooper pair interaction. I don't know, but 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 I think in some models it can come out exactly because you see they're very rank deficient. So the only thing you've got is the collective modes. Somewhere in your model, that's very hidden, hidden tunneling. Uh, prayers from, from one side to another. Uh, I wouldn't. Okay, so the in terms of the. Okay, so in terms of the pairs, so this is how the Hamiltonian looks. Okay, so it's just it's just on site projected. This would be a trivial Hamiltonian if these guys didn't have commutation relations that are non-trivial. Yeah, the only thing that's non-trivial is the commutation relations of those guys. Let's take oh. relations. Let's, let's allow integration. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So twisted bilayer graphing. So people have tried to write twisted bilayer graphing as a lead model. Okay. It turns out just to be able to implement by just adding, you know, made up orbitals in, 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 in places. It turns out that um, it's not possible if you want to keep the symmetries, at least of these continuum models, i.e. business of McDonald, et cetera, models. And that's not possible because the model is fully anomalous, actually. There was a controversy about whether the topology is fragile or stable. It turns out it's stable. So, for example, twisted bilayer has the, 
the following symmetries on the left. It's got a valley quantum number spin, and it's got these two flat bands. And the eigenvalues of the flat bands are imposed by symmetry. You cannot change them. Okay? Even if you have, if you keep particle hole symmetry, which is an emergent symmetry better than, or at the same level of spin orbit coupling, at least in the Bista McDonald type uh, continuum models. So now you can again go to the, the Bilbao crystallographic server, search for these bands, see if they're, if you can write them down as atomic limits, you see you cannot. So there's an obstruction to writing two band models. And the obstruction can be identified as the same obstruction as having, for example, a single Dirac point on the surface of a topological insulator, except here is not, it's not a surface of anything. And you literally have two Dirac nodes in every moire Brian zone, or at least vortice T2 in two. Uh, um, 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 so you take any bands from E to minus E, you can prove that there have to be a four N plus two number of Dirac points in these bands. And um, um, uh, Ann and Young are uh, the people that looked into this, into this symmetry uh, a lot more. But basically, there's no way of writing um, localized models. Now we know the phase diagram. Leonid showed it of this of this system. We're interested in tuning it from minus four to four. Okay. Now there's many approaches to this system. The one that I will look at, for example, because I already talked about projecting to flat bands, is a strong coupling projection. But I would I need to point out that there's many other approaches um, which give similar answers. Okay. The one that the strong coupling approach, which was uh, in, in this uh, Hamiltonian form pioneered by Kang and Wafek, basically has the following property that now you take a Hamiltonian that's projected into the flat bands, just like we did before, except it's a Hubbard model, not a SZ squared and, uh, model. It's a Hubbard model with positive Hubbard um, uh, Hamiltonian, with positive Hubbard uh, interaction. The only non-triviality comes from projections. You don't have the uniform pairing condition anymore on the graphene, on the twist, in twisted bilayer graphene, but you can still solve some of the states in the system. For example, Kang and Wafex showed that there is a ground state, that you can solve the ground state. And the fundamental difference is now is that even the single particle spectrum has a dispersion because the non-uniform pairing condition doesn't, ex doesn't, doesn't, exist, doesn't exist anymore. But what is the dispersion is not, you cannot understand it from a strong coupling. Why, for example, dispersion minimum is at gamma, you cannot understand it from the strong coupling from just projecting into. Um, then what we showed is that if you take the charge two spectrum of a projected Hamiltonian, there's a theorem that you cannot, without the kinetic interaction of a projected positive U Hubbard Hamiltonian, you cannot have a Cooper bound, uh, Cooper bound state. So. The, the, there's nothing below the two particle continuum. So Luttinger con doesn't exist without kinetic energy. Very phases won't save you or matrix quantum geometry won't save you. Okay. But for example, we notice like this charge plus two anti-bound states in the strong coupling spectrum didn't understand them. Why does Goldstone is flat, for example, in these ferromagnetic states is also not understood. So since I hopefully still have seven minutes, I want to present a solution to all these problems that I think it's actually generic for flat bands that have strong interactions, exact flat bands, they have strong interactions that are not, or, or with some, even with some bandwidth, um, that are not in the uniform pairing condition. In the uniform pairing condition, everything becomes much simpler. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a, a problem in twisted bilayer, and well, I'm not sure it's a problem or a feature. The feature is that STM sees a lot of localized states, okay? And of course, you see superconductivity. And the famous abstract says the correlated state features seemingly contradictory pro properties, some itinerant electrons, some localized moments. So how do you marry these two together? Well, it turns out that um, you can build a heavy fermion model of, these, uh, of this twisted bilayer. And um, in this heavy fermion model, everything that you didn't, you couldn't explain the strong coupling projection can be explained. And the low role of quantum geometry becomes clear. And I might only be able to tell you how to build this model, but the way you build this model is the, the following. You have, again, what we're interested in this is this four bands 
here in the SEBI fermion model for uh, eight bands from minus four to four, two bands per valley per spin, these flat bands here. These flat bands have these eigenvalues. What I said already is that they're topological. Hence, there's no way to build uh, Vanier states for them. Okay. But this flat bands have, uh, sorry, the, the flat bands have these eigenvalues that you can look on the plot. But what you do see is that the Coulomb interaction is large enough to actually mix some of the states in the next bands. And the next bands have a representation at the gamma point, which is gamma three. All the, you know, the in twisted bilayer, the Dirac points um, in terms of topology uh, is that's not where the topo topological action happens. It happens at the gamma point, actually. The gamma eigenvalues are the ones that does, don't let you be uh, trivial in twisted bilayer for the flat bands. But if I take these next bands, okay, I can again go to the Bilbao crystal graphic server. And if I replace the eigenvalues of the flat bands, gamma one, gamma two by a gamma three, I can immediately see that there is a atomic limit that I can build. And this atomic limit is PX, PY orbitals on the triangular lattice, exactly where the STM sees the highest density of states. So what we do is we take a couple of Vani orbitals on the PX, PY lattice. We plug them into Vani 90, project them into the Bista McDonald bands or the continuum model bands and do the, Vani, do the, do the maximum localized Vani states. And we find the following thing. We find maximum localized Vani states two per valley per spin of symmetry PX plus minus IPY at the triangular lattice with a spread of 0.2 Moire Brian zone and the hopping between them 0.1 mill electron volts. So effectively zero. So this is the Hamiltonian of these flat bands of these Vanya states is zero. And remarkably, they form 96.6% of the entire Pista McDonald bands. So 96.6%, of course, at the gamma point, they have the wrong eigenvalues. They have gamma three eigenvalues, which is a two dimensional representation, whereas the Pista McDonald flat bands have gamma one, gamma two. So they cannot give everything there, but they give 96.6%. So now we conjecture, and then we will prove that correlation physics must come from these flat bands, at least will be large. But the other 4% of the bands come from where? Well, we used one of the gamma three representations to build the, the uh, Vanier states. So now we're left with a gamma three representation, one, because we had two gamma threes, two doublets, and we're left with the former representations of a topological flat band. So this is a spectrum that looks like this, okay? There's got a double vortex here. This is a two-dimensional representation. That's the double vortex. That's the two Dirac fermions. I said that there's always have to be four N plus two Dirac fermions. Okay, so this is a topological semi-metal and it reminds you of the spectrum of untwisted AB layer graphene, okay? This is a topological semi-metal um, and now you know that you've transferred the topology from the trivial, from of the of the non-trivial flat bands of the Bista McDonald bond to a trivial flat band plus a topological thin metal. And this is the thing that you can always do with a topological insulator. You can take a topological insulator band and transfer the topology onto a topological thin metal by coupling it. Okay, the Hamiltonian of this guy looks exactly like the Hamiltonian of AB uh, bilayer graphene, with the exception that the value of this difference between the gamma one gamma two representation is very small is m and m is 3.7 mill electron volts giving you the bandwidth of the business of mcdonald bands twice times that equals about 10 or 8 mill electron volts okay so this gamma one gamma two representation mass difference this mass term is just the business mcdonald um, band so now we have a model of of twisted bilayer consisting of a heavy fermion sitting on the aa side a conduction fermion which is the AB untwisted double vortex, which solves the topology. And now we couple them. And the first coupling, the, the zeroth order coupling and the largest is gamma. And gamma is just a constant between them. And it's 24 mean electron volts. You can obtain it. Now we can obtain it analytically. Back then we only obtained it numerically. So now you have a, if you don't include umclap, uh, um, um, a six by six Hamiltonian for the Bista McDonald model. And this Hamiltonian is in the basis of four conduction fermions per valley per spin, two heavy electrons per valley. The Hamiltonian of the heavy electrons is zero, okay? Gamma here is the coupling between the heavy electrons and the conduction electrons. 
and the conduction electrons have the form of a double vortex of AV untwisted bilayer. You ask, how good is this model of reproducing the Vista McDonald bands? Well, this is how good it is. You cannot see the difference in the energy scale that is relevant for experimental physics. Okay, this is, and this gamma term, you now immediately realize what this gamma term is. This gamma term is actually the gap between <coughs> the flat bands and the um, dispersive bands. You have this, you can do the interaction. Turns out, as I advertised, the large interaction is the Hubbard U of the F electrons is the largest energy scale in the problem. In STM experiments, they usually quote U1 over two. This is the largest energy scale in the problem. The next energy scale is hybridization. And then we find that you have a ferromagnetic coupling between the F electrons and the C electrons. And when I get to the symmetry, if I get to it, this is just an SU4 times SU4 spin. Instead of being an SU2 times SU2 spin, there's a larger symmetry group in this problem. It's an SU4 times SU4 spin. So you can ask, you know, can we get this analytically? And now we can get all these values analytically. And you can ask, where is this model good? And it turns out that if you want to obtain a Anderson model, a periodic Anderson model, you better have the coupling between the F and C electrons, smaller than the Hubbard U of the of the of the F electrons, because otherwise, you know, there's no point in describing in breaking up the degrees of freedom into a heavy and a light one. And this happens in the business of McDonald model right in the region of interest. Okay, this is the chiral limit here at zero. At the chiral limit, it doesn't happen. At the chiral limit, the coupling between the F and the C electrons is much larger than U. But in the region of interest of W W1 over W. W0 over W1 equals 0 0.8, 0 0.7. Um, the validity of the heavy fermion model is good. Okay, so now one minute. What do you think? One minute, okay, very good. So, so now there's a U4 symmetry in this model, which unlike in the strong coupling, commutes with the kinetic term also. So when this parameter M in this model is zero, it has a U4 symmetry. And with this U4 symmetry, you can write as I advertised this J term as a J as a, spin spin interaction the filling now you want to ask what are the ground states the filling is controlled by the heavy electrons where you put the for example this is the filling zero where i fill this charge neutrality i fill four out of the eight electrons and i fill the fermi c of this guy okay and then you have u4 rotations to go into other other states and now the excitation spectrum becomes easy to solve one shot hartley fox turns out to be at this that filling zero to be as good as as self consistent hartley fox so what happens is I fill the F electrons with zero hybridization. Now I turn on the hybridization here and the J term, the, uh, the ferromagnetic spin, U4 spin spin interaction gives me this gap in the spectrum. Now, remember how I showed you that the single particle in the strong coupling models, and I told you, we don't know what, what, why, why the minimum is at gamma. We don't know why, why we have this bandwidth. Well, the minimum is at gamma because the conduction electron minimum was at gamma. And the, la the uh, edge of the Briand zone spectrum is flat because the conduction electron spectrum is flat. Now, because I have very little time, I wanted to basically show you that you can do this for trilayers. Okay, so you can do the same thing for trilayers. All you need to do is take the heavy fermion and recouple and couple it to another to a high velocity Dirac fermion, and then and then. Um, 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 the Hartree Fox states in 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 uh, in, uh, in the trilayers become um, um, analytically solvable, at least in one shot Hartree Fox. And then to end, I wanted to basically argue that this is a general principle when you have when you have touching points that are twisted. Okay, so if I have a touching point that is twisted and I obtain a set of flat bands, like for example. Hong Yao did in, in, the, in the checkerboard lattice. If I have touching points, then I twist them, I obtain flat bands. Then it's very likely that all the Berry curvature, even the non-abelian one, is very concentrated around the touching point because that's where it was, <laughs> and now I open it, okay? So if it's concentrated around some point in the Brian zone, then the other part of flat band, it's going to be described by some localized electrons because it has no Berry phase. So then I should always be able in these models where you get flat bands from twisting to describe my electrons by my flat bands, which, for example, even in checkerboard are topological. 
um, by a set of localized electrons and a set of conduction electrons, which carry the topology and some coupling between them, just by this general argument. And indeed, in the checkerboard, it is doable, um, uh, and this is in preparation. So thank you. So questions, please. Yeah, hi, Andre. Uh, so about the heavy fermion model, does it have a completion in the uh, mini bronze zone? Is it a completed model in the mini bronze zone? What do you mean by complete model? Uh, you show, the, a, K, you a, show the K dot P model. It's a faithful uh, model. So you take this. This one does not have the periodicity. You take this and you put umclap in the conduction fermion. The conduction, the conduction fermion as as so is the same as the surface of a TI, except it's not the surface of anything, and it's two Dirac nodes, so it's a double vortex. The conduction her fermion has to be free. The F electrons, the Hilbert space, is the mini. They have a they have the they have the Brillouin zone. So there's one per moire lattice. Uh -huh. Now the the conduction electron has to be um, um, has uh, has to be in, in the continuum because there's no you cannot you cannot put this you cannot put a Bister McDonald model on a lattice. So it has to be in the continuum. So then you do umclap on that, and then you get a faithful representation of it. Okay, the reason why I showed this, that if you take this model, okay, so actually what happens is that this gamma here has, an, has, an, has a factor with, which at high momentum, has an exponential factor which at high momentum decreases the coupling. So if you take that and just do it, just put it on the mini Brillouin zone, as you say, it's not complete. So actually it'll, just the six by six model will open a small gap here, but this gap will be very, yeah, very awesome. small because these things will still, will be very high. So for all numerical purposes, actually, you can still use this model, just truncated to this zone. But indeed, if you wanted a fully faithful description, no, no, so you just put on on clap on Thank this. Thank you. No, you're saying is that the uh, on clap process, which um, open up gap at high energy, are unimportant for studying the low energy bands. Well, the on clap doesn't open a gap at any. No, 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 no. The on clap doesn't open. A, the on clap just makes this guys do this. Okay, it doesn't open a gap. It actually makes. The um, the um clap gives you the exact correct symmetries of this entire model on the lattice. So, the the um clap, for example, if I if I added this model here has a very tiny gap at the Dirac point, okay? Because it's I didn't I didn't. But if I add um clap, this gap becomes zero immediately within two within two or within one shell, okay? It doesn't open a gap. This cannot open a gap. This is this guy, okay? No, is the continuum. I mean, in real TBG, of course, we know that in what? High energy, in real TBG, we know that the, the, the high energy. There oh, are whoa, whoa, whoa. Gaps, no, no, no. So you're in, saying, in, I what you're saying. You're saying this on clump process, you know, whatever um, the difference between this model and the real TBG is uh, occurring at high energy. Exactly. I think that's what you're saying. Exactly. Exactly. Thanks. So, so I'm, I'm, I only claim that this model, yeah, that's why I showed it only here. If I was to go here, it would start diverging. But I could also, like, for example, at least the first bands in TBG, I could also model them by adding more terms to this model. But you're right, at some point you have gaps and those you cannot model, but those gaps are, at, you know, as you know, 200 electron volts. So I claim that not, they're not interested for the low energy physics. That's the claim, indeed. Thank you, good point. Yeah, uh, and I have two questions. So let me ask one after the other. So first is about your first part when you have this completely flat dispersion. It shows the spectrum of collective two particle excitations near the minimum is quadratic, right? Uh, if we go back to conventional BCA Schlein Hamiltonians, then we have Anderson Begalibov mode, which is linear. And the question is this if you take single particle dispersion with some arbitrary small twist, will you immediately see a narrow range where the collective yes. mode? Yes, so you're so, so that's so you're 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 exactly on the on the money. So yeah. So so you take a you take a small uh, a particle uh, uh, this, this is for exact flatness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If I if I add a small particle, I'll see a linear I'll see a linear, right? The, as you said, the BCS would give you a linear part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so then then you see immediately a a, a linear part if you take okay. a if you Thanks. take a spectrum, yeah. yes. And but that, that becomes in, in you know in perturbation theory that because be, that becomes unsolvable. Yeah. We're trying to get a kinetic term where you can solve it exactly, but so far we didn't manage to. But yeah. And the second question is about 
what Leon also ask you about uh, the second part and the position of the minimum on the dispersion. So two parts of the question. First, is there any experimental evidence uh, that you can point that the gap, that the dispersion minimum is at gamma point? And second, if you play with parameters, if you don't fix parameters in your model and just take them arbitrary, is there a transition as a function of parameters of the minimum from K point to gamma point at some this point? Is, this is a very good question. So, so to the first to the first point to the first point, which you know you probably I mean you implied the answer, right? Because there is no evidence, right? No, not... Yeah, no, but but I agree with you. I don't think there's any evidence yet, right? Uh, the, but okay, so I don't think there's any evidence, and you're right, uh, that's the so. But what I what I okay, so that's what I would say is based on this, right? So this is this is the, this is a faithful description. I can model, right? So based on this, um, if I get um, the minimum at the k point, then it means two things. It means I underestimated the bandwidth of the bus. So I can get. Um, for the for the audience, for the online audience, like we cannot do it. But if you know this is a faithful description, there's no way to get the minimum away from gamma. The only way I can get the minimum away from gamma is first of all if we misestimated the bandwidth of the business of McDonald, right? So actually, these heavy fermions have a lot more dispersion in them, and they look kind of like this. Okay. Right, and and then the gap here is larger. For example, so then I could get, for example, a minimum at gamma at the, the, the k point. But that that would require, I would say, well, that would require some, um, at least in this this model, some some change in some drastic change in the values of these parameters. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't do it, but if I increase M to be, for example, 10 times this and then decrease U by a half, I think you could do it. But then you probably wouldn't trust my Hattrefoc on that because this, this Hattrefoc is very simple. U is so large, you just polarize at least at mu equals zero, mu equals one and two. At three, it starts getting, we know at three, it doesn't, it's not a stable ground state, the, the, this one. But, but so, so, but then if I don't have this band being very flat, then, you know, putting them up and down and filling them is not the most obvious way. So then you, but if I did that, I would get the minimum at gamma. I would have to increase, I would have to do a tenfold renormalization of the parameters to get it, but I, I could, I could do it. Thanks for the nice talk. I had two questions. Maybe I'll ask one first. Uh, so in the uh, heavy fermion model, you uh, you found a ferromagnetic condo interaction, which is, I think, uh, uh, deriving it from a from a periodic Anderson model. It's a little unusual. Could you say a little bit about how why you got a ferromagnetic condo interaction? Right. So from a lattice, this is not derived from a lattice model, right? So the, the my so the so the uh, the C electrons continuum is a continuum. And all you all you're doing here is re-expressing the uh, Coulomb interaction of the original electron into these two degrees of freedom. Now, what I am saying is that once you integrate, right? So normally the way you get to the anti-ferromagnetic condo is you take the Anderson model and you integrate out this gamma term, this this um, this uh, FC hybridization coupling. So we can do the same here, and we will get a ferromagnetic an anti-ferromagnetic one that will compete with this one. Okay, now, now, uh, so, 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 I'm not saying that in the final result, it would be, it would be still ferromagnetic. If I, if I did the same, you know, the regime here is a bit different than in the condo. You know, the, I have, I have a large dispersion uh, um, fermion, so, so, and some Hubbard U, which is also large. So I have to be careful about how I take the, uh, right, how, how I do the con the Schiffer Wolf, right, to get to to the condo. But if I did that, you would still get an antiferromagnetic interaction of order, say, gamma squared over u, or four gamma squared over u, which is, you know, 24 times 24 over 58, could be times some factor, two or four, could be even larger than the 14, which is j. Okay, so I don't know the final result. What I'm saying is that this appears already 
at the Anderson model level. Does that make sense? This is an outcome of projecting the Coulomb onto these. Exactly. The so outcome of projecting the Coulomb. Of a exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. So it, it is minimal coupling to an external electromagnetic field straightforward? You just ah. add it to the. <laughs> Uh, and this related question, what about the elastic tensor? Where would it come in? So very good. So I thought the, the coupling to it, because this problem is very hard to solve in B field, right? The TBG, and especially the interacting one. So I thought this would be very easy to, to you know, you just minimally coupled, as you said. The problem is the heavy fermions should not be minimally coupled, right? Only the conduction fermion. And that introduces a... Uh, basically a, a mess okay now what you can do is in the interacting states the heavy fermions are already away from from the minimum right if you only want to do the minimum then you can then you can minimally couple okay so this is what this is our calculation but the same calculation appeared earlier in wang and Buffett. okay this is the calculation of the spectrum and of the interacting spectrum so this this is numerical calculation with hybrid vanya Right, so so it's much nicer to just do minimal coupling because then you have an understanding of the spectrum. Right, this is the minimal coupling. So you see the calculations match in the sense in the sense that they see here. So what they what they could not explain. So there's a mode here, right, which is linear, which you, they could not explain. And then there's a large separation here. Actually, in the heavy fermion, this linear mode is exactly flat. If you add more terms, it becomes, it, it grows. So this, this linear term with a very small slope comes from an exact flatness of the, and comes from the double vortex, okay? So you get some features, but to actually get it uh, quantitatively fully to, to, to match is not that easy, but we, we, we yeah. So, but the, the qualitative features are there by minimal coupling. But only if you, only in the interactive, the, what saves you is that the interacting states have the heavy fermions far away. So then you can do minimal coupling. If you wanted to do, if I wanted to do the spectrum of the Bista McDonald model without interactions, then I'd be actually screwed because the heavy fermions sit at zero energy. And then I would have to, you know, those would not minimally couple. So then minimal coupling would be, would be bad. And, and elasticity, that was the other question. Sorry? Elasticity. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. optical phonons forget about right, but uh, you would be interested in the elastic properties. Yeah. So, so, I mean, well, we did look at optical phonons, but but not the, the, we didn't look at the elasticity property. So it turns out with optical phonons, with a K phonon, which which um, um, with a K phonon, which if you actually project into the bare bands. Not so. This is why I think this calculation is actually not, not uh, one hundred percent correct, right? Because you should probably project it into the bands of the strongly correlated insulators. But if you project into the flat bands, then you get a leading S wave instability, but with a very close pneumatic one, very close by, and you can get the form factors exactly from the heavy fermion. So that's the the power of this formalism is you can get analytic results. So these are the form factors for the K phonon, intervalley phonon projected to the heavy fermion. And you see, you see your D wave, what, uh, what Leonid was talking about. This is your D wave here. And this is K squared times in, in the same turn channel. It has, so if you couple the same turn bands channel, it has uh, a D wave. And the pneumatic one is very close to the, uh, to the, to the S wave one. Okay. All right, I think we same country. And all speakers of this session. So we are 20 minutes over time. So I suggest discussions proceed during. Thank you, Oleg, for being uh, very, 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 kind. very nice. Very nice. Uh, thank you. 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 Th